بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد So inshallah before we get into the actual surah we will start with some tilawa from Surah Al-Hadid. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Yawma tara al-mu'minin wal mu'minat yas'a nuruhum bayna aydihim wa bi aymanihim bushraakum al-yawm bushraakum al-yawm jannatun tajri min tahtiha al-anhar khalidin fiha thalika huwa al-fawz al-azim يوم يقول المنافقون والمنافقات للذين آمنوا انظرونا نقتبس من نوركم قيل ارجعوا وراءكم فالتمسوا نورا فضرب بينهم بسور له باب باطنه فيه الرحمة وظاهره من قبله العذاب ينادونهم ألم نكن معكم قالوا بلى ولكنكم فتنتم أنفسكم وتربصتم وارتبتم وغرتكم الأماني حتى جاء أمر الله وغركم بالله الغروب فاليوم لا يؤخذ منكم فدية ولا من الذين كفروا مأواكم النار هي مولاكم وبئس المصير ألم يأن للذين آمنوا أن تخشع قلوبهم لذكر الله وما نزل من الحق ولا يكونوا كالذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبل فطال عليهم الأمد فقست قلوبهم وكثير منهم فاسقون اعلموا أن الله يحيي الأرض بعد موتها قد بينا لكم الآيات لعلكم تعقلون إن المصدقين والمصدقات وأقرضوا الله قرضا حسنا يضاعف لهم يضاعف لهم ولهم أجر كريم والذين آمنوا بالله ورسله أولئك هم الصديقون والشهداء عند ربهم لهم أجرهم ونورهم والذين كفروا وكذبوا بآياتنا أولئك أصحاب الجحيم اعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب وله وزينة وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد كمثل غيث أعجب الكفار نباته ثم يهيج فتراه مصفرا فتراه مصفرا ثم يكون حطاما 
وفي الآخرة عذاب شديد ومغفرة من الله ورضوان وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور سابقوا إلى مغفرة من ربكم وجنة عرضها كعرض السماء والأرض أعدت للذين آمنوا بالله ورسله ذلك فضل الله يؤتيه من يشاء والله ذو الفضل العظيم صدق الله العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد Respected listeners, dearest brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's great mercy and His grace upon us that Alhamdulillah, we are here gathered together, everyone in their respective homes, we've all tuned in for one purpose and for one reason. Nobody was promised any compensation. Nobody was promised money. Nobody was promised treasures. Nobody was promised gold or silver. The only reason that brothers and sisters have logged into this session tonight is out of the sheer belief and respect and love for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and out of love for the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the only reason we have logged in, so that the brothers and sisters, we can recite, we can learn from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that we can get the benefit of the dua, of the khatam and the completion of the quran Kareem. It is mentioned by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, مجتمع قوم في بيت من بيوت الله. There is no group of people that gather together in one of the homes from the homes of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And Alhamdulillah, we may not be in the masjid, but even in our homes, you know, which is usually a place of distraction, a place of happiness and you know being busy with the family and being busy with the kids and there's so many distractions you want to go into the kitchen and get something from the fridge you go over into the room the computer is there the tv is there so many ways a person can get distracted but of all of the things alhamdulillah we have chosen that we will sit and we will listen and we will learn the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet alayhi salam mentioned, no group of people sit together in the house from the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they recite the book of Allah azza wa jal. They recite the quran Kareem, وَيَتَدَارَسُونَهُ بَيْنَهُمْ And they learn and they teach the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amongst one another. When they do this, Allah gives them a blessing. Allah gives them a benefit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them an immense favor in this dunya. نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّكِينَةِ وَغَشِيَتْهُمُ الرَّحْمَةِ غَشِيَتْهُمُ الرَّحْمَةِ وَنَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّكِينَةِ وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَ Three things that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned here is that number one, 
نزلت عليهم السكينة. Tranquility will descend upon those people. وغشيتهم الرحمة. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will envelop them. They will be surrounded by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we all know in today's day and age how easy it is to be surrounded by curses. How easy it is to be distracted and surrounded with, you know, satanic influences. But the purity of the Qur'an, the beauty of the Qur'an, when it's pure and blessed verses are recited, and the blessed verses of the quran Kareem, they are studied. Then look at what happens. The tranquility from Allah descends, and the mercy of Allah envelops, it surrounds that person. وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ Allahu Akbar. Look at the third benefit. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions these people amongst those who are with him, amongst those who are near him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of these people. Subhanallah, brothers and sisters, you know, today how fascinated people become with celebrities and superstars and athletes and all the popular and famous people of the world, right? How excited we would be that, <clears throat> you know, maybe a celebrity retweets us. Maybe a celebrity gives us a shout out. A famous athlete, you know, repost something that we've posted on social media. We'll be so elated. We'll be so ecstatic. Oh, wow, you know, such an amazing thing. The famous popular celebrity or superstar athlete, they've retweeted me. They have shared something of my social media. For them to mention us will be such a great deal, right? But Allahu Akbar, can you imagine the gathering of the angels sitting in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And Allah mentions our names amongst them. So and so of my servants. So and so amongst my servants. They're reciting the book of Allah. They're reciting my book. They're studying and teaching my book. The blessings of my book are being mentioned and they are present and they are sitting there. Allahu Akbar. Look at the blessings of the Qur'an Kareem. You know, there was one companion, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that on one particular night, and respected listeners, why I'm mentioning this, right? I know we have the topic of Surah Al-Hadid, but before we get into the topic, we must understand the blessings. We must understand how important these sessions are. We must understand and not only understand from our minds, but also feel within our hearts. Wallahi, how blessed we are. How much Allah has favored us. Not only to just be Muslims, but to be Muslims who are connected with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you know the ulama mentioned that with each prophet that came, each messenger that came, they delivered their, you know, they showed their miracles to their nations and then those miracles disappeared, right? So for example, Musa alayhi salam, he came with the staff and he was blessed with the miracle that he would put his hand underneath his arm and when he would take it out, his hand would be shining bright. Bayda, it would be shining as a miracle for the people. But once Musa alayhi salam left this world, the staff that would change into a serpent and his blessed hand that would emerge shining white and you know bright, these miracles also disappeared with the passing of Musa alayhi salam. Each prophet that came, their miracles eventually left. They were only there while these prophets manifested the miracles during their lifetimes. The one miracle, brothers and sisters, that this ummah has been blessed with, it will remain until the day of judgment. The miracle of Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his miracle was the quran Karim. And subhanallah, when we recite its verses, and when we learn the tafsir, 
and the commentary of the Quran Kareem, what is it like we're doing? It's like we're witnessing the beloved Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showing us a miracle. Allahu Akbar. It's like the people of Musa alayhi salam watching him, you know, show his staff turn into a serpent, watching his blessed hand come out shining bright. We are witnessing the miracle of Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The believer of this ummah who is not connected with the quran Kareem, it's like a ummati of, of Musa alayhi salam that while Musa is showing the staff, while Musa alayhi salam is showing the hand shining bright, his follower is sleeping at home. He hasn't seen the staff. He hasn't seen the hand shining bright. It's like a follower of Isa alayhi salam who has not seen the miracle of him bringing the dead back to life. So being connected with this book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, brothers and sisters, this is the greatest gift that a ummati of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can be blessed with. And respected listeners, the more that we open the book of Allah, the more it will give us. The more and the deeper we dig into the Quran Kareem, the greater things we will experience. La tanqadi ajaibuhu. We learn the Quran Kareem is that book, it's that magnificent miracle that its wonders and the amazing things of the Quran, they will never expire. They will never cease to exist. The more it is open, the more things we will witness from it. لا يخلق عن كثرة الرد. The Quran Kareem it does not grow old due to excessive reading. Allahu Akbar. The more you read the Quran, the more you fall in love with it. It never grows old for a true believer, right? Nobody says, "Oh, Surah Al-Fatiha." You know, we recite this so many times. You know, I'm kind of bored of Surah Al-Fatiha. Never. The more the Qur'an is recited, the more our love builds for it. And brothers and sisters, I want to mention just a little bit how the companions love the qur'an Kareem, how the Qur'an was part of their lives, how the Qur'an meant so much to them, right? This gathering that we're having, where alhamdulillah, we have the khatam of the Qur'an and a little bit of the verses of the Qur'an they are explained and the commentary is given. Wallahi, this is like reliving the way that the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een, how they would focus their lives surrounding the Quran Kareem. Right? I want to talk about Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu and how his legacy of being a lover of the Quran, how we could relive that legacy. How just, you know, droplets from his lifestyle can come alive within us today. First of all, brothers and sisters, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an, he was amongst those people who were from the first Muslims that the ummah had witnessed, from the first of the Muslims. And in Makkah Mukarramah, when speaking about Allah and speaking about Islam could get you killed. It could get you assassinated. It could get you tortured. It could get you beheaded. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an was amongst those companions who would recite the Quran out loud. They would recite the Quran audibly in front of Abu Jahl, in front of Umayyah ibn Khalaf, in front of Abu Lahab, in front of all of these hostile tyrants who showed their animosity towards Islam, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, without any fear, radiallahu an, he would recite the Qur'an jahran. He would recite the Qur'an out loud in front of all the enemies of Islam, and he was not afraid. Respected listeners, there were certain people like Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu an, who... He had a great social standing. He was very well respected by the Quraysh. You know, 
people feared him. They didn't want to mess around with Abu Bakr Siddiq to a certain extent because of his social standing. He was wealthy. He was influential. He had a lot of ties with different people. So for him to recite the Quran out loud, it makes sense. Nobody's going to say anything to him. Although he also, eventually their animosity led them to even attack Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an. But Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an, he was not at the level of Abu Bakr Siddiq of having ties and having a relationship with the people of the Quraysh and being on a social platform. No. He didn't have that standing in society, but still he would recite the book of Allah openly, proudly, fearlessly. He would recite Allah's book without fearing the consequences. And subhanallah, his love for the Quran led him that it came to the point where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, what would he say? Man sarrahu an yaqra al-Quran that <clears throat> anybody who wishes to read the quran kareem in the best of ways kama unzil just as it has been revealed right to to recite the quran in the best of ways who doesn't want that right in a way that's pleasing to allah in a way that it was actually revealed the Prophet ﷺ is saying, if anyone wishes to read this way, then what should they do? Then they should recite upon the recitation of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. This narration is reported by Imam Ahmad. Rahimahullah. Basically, the Prophet ﷺ authorized the qira'ah and the recitation and the way that Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an, the way that he would recite the Qur'an. And just a few more things before we get into the actual surah. I don't want to take too much of time just on the intro, but wallahi, it's very important for us to understand, right? The importance of why we connect with Allah's book. This is a very, very important thing. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an, his knowledge and his love for the Qur'an was such that he, he used to say, وَالَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ غَيْرُهُ He would say that by oath of the one that there is no, there is no God besides him. مَا نَزَلَتْ آيَةٌ مِّنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ the hadith is reported in the Sahih of Imam Muslim. Rahimahullah. He says there is no verse in the book of Allah that has been revealed. Except that I know where it was revealed. Was it in the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Was it between the Hajjari Aswad and the Rukni Yamani? Was it in Medina Munawwara? Was it in Masjid al Nabawi? Was it on the journey between Mecca and Medina? Where the verse was revealed? Ana a'lamu fima nazalat. I know where the verse was revealed. And there is no verse that has been revealed in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that I know fima nazalat. Aina nazalat wa fima nazalat. I know the circumstances, the context, the background, why that verse, that particular verse, why it was revealed. And he says, if I were to know that there is somebody who is more knowledgeable in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than me. If I know that such a person exists and my conveyance can reach that person, right? My camel or my horse can reach that person. And he has more knowledge than in the book of Allah than me. Then you better believe that most definitely Abdullah bin Mas'ud 
would take the journey to learn from that person. Allahu Akbar. Look at Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Despite knowing so much, despite being such a great alim of the Qur'an, a great mufassir of the Qur'an, he said, if I knew somebody else knows more of it, I would go to them so that I could seek the knowledge of this Qur'an. Respected listeners, this is why I'm mentioning why it's so important to understand this gathering that we're upholding, right? Of sincerely seeking knowledge, sincerely seeking the knowledge of the Qur'an, we are following the way of our pious predecessors. We're on that pathway. Of course, we can't reach them. Of course, we can never be, you know, we can't even equal the dirt that was on their shoes when walking alongside the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But at least to follow in their footsteps, Wallahi, it's a great honor for us. We can never be near them. We can never be as close as they are. But just to walk along that path, right? Get one droplet out of the oceans that these people possess. Subhanallah, this is greater than all of this dunya and all that it contains to just be able to be, you know, a droplet from the oceans that these people were. Subhanallah, brothers and sisters, the zeal and the eagerness and the love of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu and his connection with the Qur'an, it led him to such a rank. It led him to such a position, brothers and sisters, that the Prophet alayhi salam himself, he comes to Abdullah bin Mas'ud and he says, Iqra alayya. Can you imagine? The Prophet alayhi salam tells him, recite the Qur'an upon me. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an, he replies, aqra wa alayk wa alayka unzil? Should I recite the Qur'an upon you, O Messenger of Allah, whereas it is revealed upon you? The Qur'an is descended upon you. The revelation comes down upon you. How is it possible that I will recite to you? You're the one that usually recites to us. We learn the Quran Kareem from you. Right? How can I read upon you when you are the one that it is revealed upon? Allahu Akbar. Brothers and sisters, amazingly, look at the Prophet alayhi salam, what he said. He said, Uhibbu an asma'ahu min ghayri. He said, I love to hear the Qur'an from other than me. Subhanallah. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ, he reads it himself. He hears his own recitation. And subhanallah, we know, you know, he's hearing the recitation from Jibreel ﷺ. He's hearing the recitation. It comes to him from who? From Jibreel salam. But still, who does he want to hear the recitation from? From a human being, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an. Why? The recitation of a human being who shows, you know, his love for the Qur'an. He leaves all of his responsibilities. She leaves all of her responsibilities. And they devote this time for Allah's book. Allah loves it so much. And the Prophet salam loves that recitation so much, he wants to hear it from Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Which, you know, who's asking this, brothers and sisters? We have to remember, this is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You will not get any greater recitation than the recitation of the Prophet salam. And subhanallah, the recitation which he can hear, he hears it from Jibreel alayhi salam. But still, he wants to hear the recitation of Abdullah bin Mas'ud because he was such a lover of the Quran Kareem. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he says, while I was reciting the Quran, he says, I recited from Surah An-Nisa. I recited, I recited, I recited. And finally, he reaches the verse where Allah Azza wa Jal talks about how, you know, the previous nations this ummah will be witness upon the previous nations. 
Each nation will have a witness that will testify against that nation. And we will bring you, O Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a witness upon this nation. So finally, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, you know, the Prophet alayhi salam told him, Hasbuk, that's enough. You've recited enough. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud, radiyallahu an, when he looks up, what does he see? فَإِذَا عَيْنَاهُ تَذْرِفَانِ He says, when I looked up, I saw... The eyes of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were dripping and they were shedding tears. Allahu Akbar. Look at the love that these people had with the Qur'an. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an, his, these interactions that he had with the Qur'an were, was, was such that it's mentioned. Anytime people used to visit him, you know, like any time he had guests, what would happen? Nasharul Masahif. They would open up the Quran. Wakana Yufasiru Lahum. He would make tafsir of the Quran for them. Right? He would do tafsir of the Quran for them and explain it to them. You know, today when the guests come, the only thing we're concerned about make sure there's food, make sure there's chai, make sure there's some samosas. You know, make sure you're offering them something. Subhanallah. Abdullah bin Mas'ud went above and beyond. Right? Of course, you know, he was hospitable to his guests. He was the greatest, you know, a great host. But at the same time, his hospitality was not just for their physical needs. His hospitality even extended to their spiritual needs. So anyone that would come to his house as his guest, they would leave with some knowledge of the Qur'an. They would leave with some tafsir of the Qur'an. Brothers and sisters, why I'm mentioning this is because we have to understand what role this plays for every believer. Right? We should be immersed with knowledge of the Qur'an. We should be immersed night in, day in, day out. Constantly, our life should revolve around learning and teaching the quran -i kareem building our knowledge and connecting ourselves with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Respected listeners, with this being said, you know, we took a long time with the introduction. No problem, inshallah. This is, uh, you know, a series. So we will always continue, learn more and more about Surah Al-Hadid, inshallah. But uh, on our last session, we had covered that Surah Al-Hadid, it is from the Musabbihat. What is the Musabbihat? Those surahs which begin with Sabbaha or Yusabbihu and they denote the glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Glorifying and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And respected listeners, we had covered that the Prophet السلام, he used to read these surahs, these five surahs of the Musabbihat. He would recite them every night before going to sleep. This was his connection with these surahs. And wallahi, it's so amazing just to read these surahs and know my Prophet وسلم, he would read word for word these exact surahs. I'm reading exactly what the Prophet السلام, used to read. Right? And amazing that right at the start of the surah, we see Allah manifests and shows His power and He shows His qudra and He shows His greatness in the beginning of the surah by mentioning. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created the heavens and the earth in six days. And then he established the throne. He established dominion and rulership and authority over the throne. At this point, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that six days, 
the heavens and the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this. I want us to think about something. Think about how great the skies are. How great is outer space? How great are all of these galaxies? The majority of which the human brain cannot even comprehend. We cannot even imagine the vastness of the celestial bodies and the universe, the galaxies which are out there. We cannot even comprehend how great they are, how vast they are, how spacious. The human mind is too small. It's too limited to understand the great outer space. So all of these skies, Allahu Akbar, and this amazing great earth, much of which has been unexplored, the oceans, which subhanAllah, human beings, we have not even explored, we have not even traveled inside to understand and see how deep these oceans go and how much of it is there and what amazing things are inside. We haven't even tapped into all of that with how long the earth has been around and how much technology has increased. We still have not even explored that. These great heavens and this amazing, magnificent earth was created in how long? Only six days. Now, I want to touch on this a little bit, brothers and sisters. Let us understand one point. That you know for a great thing to become established, for a very, you know, a great thing, a great project, it demands what? A great project is going to demand a great amount of time, a great amount of planning, a great amount of execution, depending on how great that thing is. Right. So just as an example, you look at the tallest building on the earth, right? What's the tallest building? Burj Khalifa, right? Tallest building in the world. How long did it take? I believe 2004, they started six years it took to build the Burj Khalifa. The second biggest or tallest Building on earth, Shanghai Tower, almost seven years. The Mecca Royal Clock Tower, which we all see when we go for Hajj and Umrah. The clock tower there in Mecca, almost eight years. Right, This clock tower, this Shanghai Tower, this Burj Khalifa, right? compared to the universe, compared to the entire earth, Right? This is like a needle in a haystack. It's nothing. It's like a small little ant. But look, it took the human being six, seven, eight years for these things. This amazing universe, which has been created with perfection, for this to be created in six days, it's very, very amazing. However, brothers and sisters, we have to remember, for Allah's power, which is unrestricted and unlimited for Allah's greatness, even six days was not required. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? That when Allah wants to decree something, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to decide something, then how easy is it for him? He says to it, be and, and it is. So for the heavens and the earth to be created, Allah didn't even need to give it six days. Allah could have simply said, Kun fayakun, be and it is. You know, as, as soon as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides the heavens will be, the earth will be, automatically it would have come into existence. Automatically it would have happened. That raises a question for us now. What is the significance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth in six days? Why didn't he just say, be and it is? You know, with the snap of a finger, right? That amount of time. 
the time that it takes to blink an eye, Allah could have just decided and right away, the, the heavens, the earth, everything would have been created perfectly. But it, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided instead it will take six years or, or six days. The Mufassireen mention there is a hikmah in this. There is a wisdom in this. And what is the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this? It is to show insan. It is to show me. It is to show you that, oh human being, if you want success in your endeavors, if you wish to have success in your affairs, it's not going to happen through haste. It's not going to happen by being abrupt. It's not going to happen by, you know, by josh, by being irrational and just jumping to do things. To be successful and to flourish, you have to put your mind to something. You have to have a game plan. You have to have a plan. You have to think about it. You have to have, a, you know, your game plan and then you have to execute. It's not going to be through Josh that all of a sudden, you know, a person stands up and they say, MashaAllah, I heard this lecture about the tafsir and, you know, I'm booking my ticket tonight and I'm going to go overseas to an Islamic country and I'm going to spend the next 20 years learning the Quran, right? It's a great intention, MashaAllah. It's a great, you know, thing that you want to learn the Quran, but that's not how abruptly and suddenly you make huge decisions Allah teaches us in this verse the heavens and the earth took six days so oh insan when you're planning your life when you're making major decisions when you are doing things you need to have a plan you need to give it some time you need to think things out you need to make sure you are thinking of all the different aspects and all the different ang angles before you take a decision Right? SubhanAllah, we see so many people, they make decisions, they regret it the next day. They regret it the next hour. Right? Think, ponder, look at every angle, and then you come to, to decide. SubhanAllah, we see that, you know, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, Al anatu min Allah wal ajalatu min ash shaytan, that to be sudden, to make sudden decisions, right? To be hasty in your actions, this is from the shaitan, right? Whereas being calm, having a good pace, thinking things out, this comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is from the blessings of Allah azza wa jal, that you are calm, you are collected, you do things, you know, with, with reason, you do things logically, you do things in a planned and in a very rational way. This is from the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the beginning of Surah Hadid, Allah Azza wa Jal, He makes mention of this to show the Ummah, to show mankind, take your time in things. Ahabbu al-a'mali ilallah Adwamuha wa in qalla. The Prophet السلام, said that the greatest and the best of deeds is which deed? That which is most consistent. Wa in qal. Even if it's very, very small, the fact that you continuously do it is part of your life. You've thought it out. This is most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if that deed might be small, right? So this is what Islam teaches us. It's not about doing abrupt and big fancy things. Do things small, do things calculated, do things in a planned way. And when you do this, Allah puts barakah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves it from you. Respected listeners, I know time is getting short, so I'm going to share some reflections on one more verse and inshallah then we will conclude in verse number 9 of surah al hadid allah azza wa jal makes mention it is allah who descends upon his servant yani rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ayatim bayyinat 
verses which are very, very clear. This is from the miracles of the Quran Kareem, is that its, its verses, they make it very, very clear that these are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are this is a divine scripture. This cannot be from the words of human beings. Right? And part of what shows us that is what comes next. Right? Why are these verses revealed on the Prophet, السلام, which are very clear and they show us clearly the signs of Allah? So that He may remove you from darknesses into light. Allahu Akbar. This is what this is from the sifat of the Quran. This is from the beauties of the Quran Kareem, is that it removes you from darkness and it takes you into light. Brothers and sisters, we need to ask ourselves, when we perform salah, we're reciting the Quran. When we are doing our tilawa and we're actually reading the Quran, what is our feeling inside of our hearts? How do you feel before you've read the Quran and after you have read the Quran? How do you feel before a tafsir session and after a tafsir session? If your recitation has been accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if your recitation was sincere for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then wallahi, believe me, brothers and sisters, you will feel a light inside of your heart. You will feel a type of purity inside of your heart. You will feel that you have gone through some type of spiritual cleansing. Your heart will feel lighter. Your mood will feel happier. Your mindset will feel better. You will feel more motivated. The Quran will have left its imprint on you. This is what Allah is saying in Surah Al-Hadid from the sifat and the qualities of the Quran. Why is it revealed to the Prophet ﷺ? So that he can remove you from darknesses and bring you into light. Brothers and sisters, if we read the Quran, but we still feel like we're in darkness. If we study the Quran, but we still feel like we are in darkness, we are not studying it and reading it the right way. We need to focus more. We need to clean our hearts more. We need to be more sincere. We need to understand and have respect and realize what it is that we are reading, what exactly it is that we are studying. When we understand its value, when we give it its due respect, when we give it that position that it deserves, yatlunahu haqqatilawati, right? They recite it, the right of its recitation. Then what will we see? We will see our hearts will be purified. From darkness, we will feel like a lantern has been ignited within our hearts. And moving on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention, لَا يَسْتَوِي مِنْكُمْ مَنْ أَنْفَقَ مِنْ الْفَتْحِ وَقَاتَلِ That those people who had spent and fought before the conquest of Mecca, they are not the same like the people who came after them. Those are the pioneers, the people who fought and they spent of their wealth in the difficult era, in the difficult times, in those moments where Muslims were suffering, they were being persecuted, they were being tortured. These handful of people who remain steadfast, those who came later when things were easy, things became normal, Islam started to spread. Yes, their sacrifices are greatly appreciated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those amongst them who were sahaba, they're greatly respected. They're greatly appreciated. But they cannot reach the status of as-sabiqoon al-awwaloon, the initial people who sacrificed their time, their money, their blood that they had given for this deen. أُولَٰئِكَ أَعْظَمُ دَرَجَةً مِّنَ الَّذِينَ أَنْفَقُوا مِن بَعْدُ وَقَاتَلُوا Those people that came Initially, they are a status above. They are greater in rank than those who spent and fought, uh, you know, who came later and spent and fought. The first people, they're a rank above because they were in the era of difficulty and they persevered through it. 
And Allah mentions a beautiful thing thereafter. وَكُلًّا وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْحُسْنَى However, for all of them, those companions which came before, those companions which came after, for all of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises them what? Goodness. Husna. And what exactly is husna? Al-Jannah. It is Jannah. Allah has promised them Jannah. رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن Allah is pleased with them. They are pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These great companions, brothers and sisters, no matter how pious a person may be, no matter how many hajj we may do, how many umrah we may do, how many khatams of the Qur'an we may do, we cannot even reach the dirt on the feet, on the sandals of these great people that Allah has specially selected them. For what? That they will be the people fighting alongside the Prophet wasallam. They are the selected people that they will hear the words of the Qur'an directly from the Prophet wasallam. All of those difficulties, you know, the times of not having food, not having drink, the times of having to sacrifice their lives, witnessing their children, their brothers, their sisters, their loved ones, being martyred in all of those difficult battles. These were the people that Allah had selected them, right? Subhanallah. Some of the people mentioned, you know, I wish I was alive during that time. I wish that I could have fought alongside the Prophet ﷺ. Many of those companions, they would say, don't wish any of those things because you don't know what type of sacrifice was, was required of us. You might not have lasted you might not have been able to follow through. You might have been amongst those people who went back on their heels, right? Who turned, who turned around, who said, we can't do this. We're not able to follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We can't take the heat of our families, our tribes, all of the society going against us. We can't tolerate the hunger and starvation and, and thirst that the Muslims had to go through. Right? And subhanAllah, in Islamic history, they make mention that one of the people who made these types of statements, he said, I wish I was a companion. I wish I, you know, I would have served them maybe better. I would have served the Prophet wasallam maybe better than some of the companions could have served him. Na'udhu Billah, they made this type of statement. And in the nighttime, this person had a dream. What did they see in their dream? In the dream, they saw that there is a carriage. And in this carriage, the Prophet ﷺ is sitting next to him. And amongst them, there are companions, Sahaba, radiallahu anhum. And they're all sitting together when suddenly the carriage starts going downhill and is picking up speed. And the announcement is made, O oh people, the life of the Prophet ﷺ is in danger. This carriage needs to slow down. This carriage needs to stop because as it's moving downhill, it keeps picking up speed. It can crash and it can endanger the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this person who's, who had this dream after making these statements, I wish I was alive in the time of the Prophet sallallahu I would have been a great companion. You know, I would have tolerated all the difficulties that the Muslims had to go through. He said in this dream, He's looking for some type of rock. He's looking for a garment. He's looking for a boulder. Just something that he can throw in front of this carriage so that the wheels, you know, might trample over it and the carriage will slow down. He said, as I'm looking left, I'm looking right, I'm trying to find something to throw. He said, suddenly, what do I see? I see the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They have jumped out of the caravan. They've jumped out of this carriage and they're throwing their bodies in front of the carriage, right? They're allowing the carriage to run over their bodies so that they could slow it down so that the Prophet alayhi salam may be at peace. He may be at ease. He may be safe. And this is exactly what these people did. Radiallahu anhum ajma'een. They gave their bodies, they gave their souls, they gave to their last breaths. They gave it for the sake of Allah. They gave it to defend Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
And today we recite La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Why? It was on account of their sacrifices, brothers and sisters. Can you imagine, you know, if a person, you know, they left behind, suddenly you get a message and it says, you know, there's been a person who's passed away and in their will, they've given you something. It says, what is we, what has that person given me? You come to check, $10 million, $100 million that person has left behind. And he says, you know, I love you so much. I leave all of this behind for you. You know, the rest of your life, you will thank that person. You will make dua for that person. You will love that person. You will appreciate that gift that they have given you. And you will always value what they've done for you, right? More valuable than any money, than, you know, any millions and billions of dollars that this world could offer us. Greater than all of that, is this gift of La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Do you know why we recite this kalima? Of course, it's the, the blessing and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But on top of that, it's the sacrifices of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions that fought alongside and carried his word, carried this Quran, carried this deen generation to generation so that we could be Muslims today it's on account of their sacrifices, right? So the same way that if somebody gave us 10 million, we would love them and appreciate them and think about them every day. We need to think about these great companions, make dua for them, read about them, learn about them, follow their lifestyles. Allahu Akbar. In the quran Kareem, we see in Surah Al-Hadid, Allah is praising them and promising them Jannah. وَكُلَّمْ وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْحُسْنَى Allah says in Surah Hadid, for all of them, right? Yes, the beginning ones, they had more virtue than those who came later. But for all of them, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْحُسْنَى Allah has promised goodness for all of them. Subhanallah. If Allah has promised them Jannah, what does that show us? If we follow in their footsteps, their footsteps lead where? Also towards Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Grant us all tawfiq. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and allow us to follow in their footsteps, to be like them, to love them, to appreciate all of the khayr and you know, the favors that they have left behind for all of us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring ease in our lives and in our connection with the quran -i Kareem. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us shifa through the quran -i Kareem, to grant us taqwa through the quran -i Kareem. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this Qur'an becomes a nood and a intercessor on the Day of Judgment for all of us. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir raheem. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq min sharri ma khalaq wa min sharri ghasiqin idha waqab wa min sharri naffathati fil 'uqadi wa min sharri hasidin idha hasad Bismillahir rahmanir rahim qul a'udhu bi rabbin nasi malikin nasi ilahin nas min sharri al waswas al khannas الذي يوسوس في صدور الناس من الجنة والناس بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام م ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون والذين يؤمنون بما أنزل إليك وما أنزل من قبلك 
وبالآخرتهم يوقنون أولئك على هدى من ربهم وأولئك هم المفلحون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم اغفر لنا ولجميع المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات اللهم اشف مرضانا ومرضى المسلمين وارحم موتانا وموت المسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم انصر من نصر دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وجعلنا منهم اللهم إنا نسألك من فجاءة الخير ونعوذ بك من فجاءة الشر اللهم إنا نسألك العفو والعافية والمعافاة الدائمة في الدين والدنيا والآخرة اللهم أصلح لنا شأننا كله ولا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين فإنك إن تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين تكلنا إلى ضعف وعورة وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين